this morning. Stand with me just a little while longer. Listen, do me a favor. Let's let's share this let's share this service with our constituents, our family, our friends, our followers. Right now, do me a favor, be good electronic evangelist, would you? And get your smart device out. And I want you to go to our New Direction Christian Church Facebook page and share this stream. Come on, somebody at home needs to hear what God's getting ready to say through this vessel this morning. Would you do that, please? I see y'all typing. Thank you so much for being obedient. Please share. Uh, so excited about what's coming up this coming week. This is Holy Week. We got a lot of great things planned. Starting with Tuesday night. Thank y'all for being on for Tuesday night Bible study online. I'll be teaching this week. Uh, holiness does not make you weak. It's Holy Week, and I want to teach you on Tuesday night in Bible study online. Holiness does not make you weak. Holiness is still right. Look at somebody and tell them holiness is still right. And so this week, as we head into Easter, I want you to consecrate yourselves. I want you, even if you haven't fasted all of 40 days, what can you lay down for Jesus this week? Tell somebody, consecrate this week. It's Holy Week. That's Tuesday night. Then Wednesday, we got, we got our last workout Wednesday, I believe, this coming Wednesday uh, at 6 o'clock. Come way in, and then 6.30, we're going to work out our last workout Wednesday. And then Thursday, y'all, Thursday, it's about to go down. Look at somebody and say revival. Y'all, if I don't, you remember, how many of y'all remember when we were younger, our mamas kept us in church all day? Do y'all, does anybody old enough remember five night revivals? Anybody old enough remember three night revivals? Look at your neighbor and say only one night though. We only have one night of revival. I'm asking you, I'm pleading with you, would you please show up? Everybody in mass this Thursday, Dr. Jamal Harrison Bryant from New Birth Missionary Baptist Church in Atlanta, Georgia. My frat and my brother in Christ is going to come and be our guest evangelist that night. How many of y'all can promise me that you're going to come back Thursday night? Raise your hand. Amen. Come on, one night. Look at your name and say, quit tripping. It's just one night. Friday, I'll be in Lindenwood for the seven last words and then Saturday, how many we're going to be baptizing Saturday? If you know anybody who wants to get baptized, we'll be at Wind Ridge Elementary Park at what time, y'all? 11, thank you. 11 o'clock at Wind Ridge Elementary Park. We're going to be baptizing 200 people. I'm touching and agreeing. T shake your neighbor's hand. I'm touching and agreeing. We're going to be baptizing 200. If you know somebody who wants to give their life to Christ, they want to be baptized, please sign them up today so that we can baptize them. And then, Pastor Brown, we're having an Easter egg hunt for the children. How many Easter eggs we got, man? 5,000. Woo! Look at somebody and say, we got 5,000 eggs. We need 5,000 kids. <laughs> no, 500. 500. We need 500 kids. That's one egg per kid. What am I thinking about? 500 kids. Look at your neighbor and say, bring a kid with you Saturday. Can y'all do all that? And then what is, what's next Sunday, y'all? What's next Sunday, y'all? How many people y'all bringing with you? Everybody hold up three fingers. One for the father. One for the son. Patrick, hold your hand up. One for the Holy Ghost. Look at your neighbor and say, I'm, I'm responsible for three. And so are you. All right. There's a word for the Lord on Palm Sunday. Are you ready for it? Let's go to Mark chapter 11, verses 1 through 11. Mark 11, 1 through 11. Since your bracket is busted, let's go here and get some hope. Mark 11, 1 through 11, the New Living Translation reads this way. As Jesus and his disciples approached Jerusalem, they came to the towns of Bethpage and Bethany on the Mount of Olives. Jesus sent two of them on ahead. Go into that village over there, he told them, and as soon as you enter it, you will see a young donkey tied there that no one has ever ridden. Look at somebody and say, it hasn't been broken in yet. Untie it. And bring it to me. If anybody asks, what are you doing? 
Just say this, the Lord has need of it, and he'll give it back soon. Look at somebody beside you and say, the Lord has need of you. The two disciples left and found the colt standing in the street, tied outside the front door. And as they were untying it, some bystanders demanded, what are y'all doing untying that coat? And they said what Jesus said, the Lord has need of it. And they permitted them to take it. Then they brought the coat to Jesus and threw their garments over it, and he sat on it. And many in the crowd spread their garments on the road ahead of him, and others spread leafy branches they had cut in the fields. Jesus was in the center of the procession, and the people all around him were shouting, Praise God, blessings on the one who comes in the name of the Lord, blessings on the coming kingdom of our ancestor David, praise God in the highest heaven. So Jesus came to Jerusalem and went into the temple, and after looking around carefully at everything, he left because it was late in the afternoon. Then he returned to Bethany with the 12 disciples. Jesus told the disciples to go into a town and find a coat that had never been written before and untie it. And if anybody asks you, what are you doing? You tell them that the Lord has need of it. And they got the coat and they brought it to Jesus and they threw their cloaks and they cried, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. What I want to ask you today is can you ride or die? Uh, look at somebody on the way to your seat and say, I need a ride or die. Y'all can sit down in this presence of the Lord. Do I have any ride or die saints in here? Do, do y'all even know what that means? Ride or die. Are you a ride or die friend? Are you a ride or die friend? Are you a ride or die saint? Are you a ride or die disciple? Are you a ride or die chick? As both a term and concept, ride or die, was spread through hip-hop, music, and culture and eventually gained popularity in the mainstream lexicon as an expression used in reference to any friend, family member, or romantic partner who will always stick by your side, who will ride or die with you to the end. It was someone who was extremely loyal. According to the Ride or Die Project, a website dedicated to exploring the stories of women who have lived by the Ride or Die philosophy, the concept of Ride or Die emerges in 1990s hip-hop as a modern urban take on the legendary outlaw couple Bonnie and Clyde. The term ride or die appears in early 2000s rap music, notably a 2000s song called I Need a Ride or Die Chick by The Locks featuring DMX. Early uses of this term were typically applied to women with phrases such as ride or die chick being used to refer, watch this, to a woman who is willing to ride with or support her partner, especially a man living a dangerous lifestyle, no matter what, even if it meant death. In the 2010s, ride or die expanded from its original gangster context and the Ride or Die Project, for instance, generally used the term to signify undying loyalty to a partner, especially in the context of mass incarceration of black women in the U.S. who held it down while their men were in prison. Gucci Mane's wife was a Ride or Die chick. He left her $2 million when he got locked up, didn't know when he was going to get out. When he got out, she gave him his $2 million back, and she had gained another four. This ride or die chick, you need a chick like that, huh? <laughs> While some black women have embraced ride or die as an empowering and positive construct, others have challenged it as a harmful stereotype and sexist model of black womanhood. When I hear the phrase ride or die chick, or ride or die, I think of it in a positive sense of someone who is locked in and loyal. Somebody say locked in and loyal. I don't know about y'all, but in this stage of my life, I don't need any fickle friends. I need some people who are ride or die. I, I don't want to be going through something, look up and you gone because you didn't sign up to go through what I'm going through right now. A friend, a brother is born in the times of adversity. I don't need any fair weather friends. 
uh, New Edition said it best. Everybody loves sunny days, but tell me, can you stand the rain? I don't need anybody who just wants to ride with me when I got money in my pocket. I need somebody that can ride with me through the valley on my way to the mountain. Is there anybody in here who can testify, I need some ride or die friends. I need somebody who's locked in. I need somebody who's loyal. I need some ride or die saints. I need some people who just don't show up on Easter. I need some people who can show up on Palm Sunday. I need some people who can show up in my good days and my bad days. Is there anybody in here who can agree with me? I need, in this stage, I need some ride or die friends. But here's the question for you. Are you a ride or die friend? You can't draw who you ain't. If you're not loyal, why are you demanding loyalty? If you're not friendly, why are you expecting somebody to be friendly to you? He who has friends must what? First show him or herself friendly. You've got to be loyal. You've got to be dedicated. Uh, Jesus told his disciples that he chose them. Lie. Jesus told his disciples, I chose you, you didn't choose me. And maybe that's where a lot of us have messed up is that you keep choosing friends and God's trying to give you some ride or die, but your discernment is thrown off because you got to recognize that sugar looks like salt. Some of y'all choose friends because they look salty, like they're transformative, but they're really sugar disguised as salt, and it's sweet for a little while until it ain't. Y'all have got to use your discernment and let Jesus choose your friends. Y'all y'all ain't going to help me. He says, I have chosen you. You didn't choose me. And when Jesus chooses friends, they locked in, but when you choose friends, they disappear. Some of y'all are running why people ghosted you in this season because they weren't friends. You didn't, he didn't choose them, you did. Watch this. In John 15, 13 through 18, Jesus says, Greater love has no one than this, than someone laid down his life, what? For his friends. He says, You are my friends if you do what I command you. No longer do I call you servants. For the servant does not know what his master's doing. But I've called you friends. Somebody say friends. For all that I have heard from my father, I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should abide. So that whatever you ask the father in my name, he may give it to you. When you ride or die with Jesus, he says, ask anything of the father and it's going to happen because you're my friend. Y'all not listen to me. When you locked in with Jesus, Jesus is locked in with you. He says, abide in me and I abide in you and you will what? Bear much fruit. But you got to ride or die. He's not just bestowing this on anybody. It's got to be people who are locked in to him. As we head into Holy Week this week, we remember the time when Jesus made his triumphant entry. It seems oxymoronic to call this a ride of triumph. Because Jesus was riding into Jerusalem to die. Uh, he was looking for a ride with him or better yet something to ride on. In order to fulfill his destiny, he needed to find, watch this, a ride or die. I believe that even in 2024, Jesus has some unfinished business, but he's still looking for a ride or die. But I got a feeling that some of y'all are unavailable because you're just like the donkey in this text. You're tied up and you ain't been broken in yet. <laughs> Jesus wants to use you, Matt, but you're tied up. He, he, he wants to use you in ministry, but you keep running. He wants to give you more, but you're always unavailable because every time Jesus whispers in your ear, you got something going on. You too busy for him to use you. Look at somebody and tell them, I think I'm tied up because I haven't been available for God to use me. Like I know God wants to. Can y'all tell the truth? Come on, for real, man. Has anybody ever called you and asked you for a favor? And you said to them, I can't. I'm tied up right now. 
when was the last time God whispered to you? And your response, maybe not verbally, but through your choices and decisions, what you told Jesus was, I'm tired of it. Huh. <laughs> Jesus has need of you to be his ride or die, but you're tired of it. You belong to somebody else. You're unbroken, and you've never been broken in. You are oblivious to the fact that you were created for more. Ooh, good God Almighty. Listen to this. Y'all are, some of y'all are oblivious to the fact that you were created for more than what people have designated you for. Can I, can I break this down? Because y'all just kind of going to sleep on me. This donkey, this, this young ass, donkey, that's what they called him. <laughs> this donkey, this ass, he had never been ridden. And watch this. Most people thought he would just be, listen, a beast of burden, a pack mule. All he was bred for was to pack equipment or people. Little did this donkey know that he would be mounted by a king. <laughs> Some people look at you and write you off as just a blue-collar worker. They look at you as a side chick. They look at you as you're going to be just like your daddy. But little do they know that Jesus has need of you. <laughs> Would you be surprised this morning that I, if I were to tell you that there's more that God wants out of you than what they have designated for you? Y'all ain't going to talk to me this morning. I just need 50 people who got it to spring up on your feet and say, I believe I got more inside of me. I believe there's more than working for corporate America. I believe there's more than just going through the motions and getting a paycheck. I believe there's more than being somebody's side piece. I believe that God has more for me, and I ain't settling for less any longer because I know the Lord has needed me. Could you high-five your neighbor and say, the Lord has need of me? Watch this. Watch this. It's time for Jesus to ride into Jerusalem, but he needs a ride or die. Not just any ride, but he's specific about what he needs in order to fulfill the prophecy. It's been prophesied uh, 400 years ago, 400 prior to Jesus coming up on the scene. It's been prophesied in Zechariah chapter 9 that we should see our king come riding in on the foal of a donkey. It's been prophesied that when the Messiah comes, he's going to come riding into Jerusalem on the donkey. Are y'all with me? Some of you hermeneutically skeptic people who think that the Bible's been tampered with will look at this story and say, Ah, Jesus was aware of the scripture and he knew, I feel the Holy Ghost, and he knew what the prophecy had said in Zechariah. So this is a self-fulfilling prophecy for Jesus to go and tell the disciples to go get a donkey that had never been ridden and to bring it to him so that it could look like he was the Messiah. Oh, but I got to tell you that this is not a self-fulfilling prophecy because in order for this to take place, everybody in the story got to participate. Now, he could go and ask, but he specifically, y'all got to help me. He knew there would be Negroes like you sitting in the audience 2,000 years ago, 2,000 years later, and, and you would come up with all these questions, all these, all these uh, what do I want to say, conspiracy theories that you've gotten from the Internet that Jesus was just a good teacher, and he just happened to pick a donkey like it said it would in Zechariah chapter 9. Anybody could have done that. But that's why Jesus, knowing how you would think, he said, bring me a donkey that, watch this, has never been broken and bring me a donkey that belongs to somebody else y'all not going to help me today here's, the, here's my first question can you take a risk for Jesus if you're his disciple okay y'all got to wake up uh, who took a risk in this story who, who was the first people to take a risk in this story right here just use your deductive logic and tell me, who do you think took a risk in this story? The disciples? Who? The guys that went in it. Why, Michael, is that a risk for them? They knew they could get dealt with. If, if you're going to take some, okay, 
y'all, y'all acting funny. I got to bring it down to modern times. I need two of y'all to go to Carrieville to the Ford dealership, and I need you to go get a Mustang that's brand new on the parking lot. I need you to go on and get that thing. Uh, just hot, hot wire, do whatever you need to do. Just go on and get in it. And if anybody comes out on the parking lot and asks you what you're doing, just say, Pastor Spencer needs it, and he'll bring it right back. Can I get some volunteers, please? Go. Ron, you're not going to go to jail. You're not going to go to car. You're give me a Mustang. Do you see what I'm saying? He says, go in the village down the road, and you'll find, J.J., <laughs> you'll find a donkey that has never been ridden, tied up, and I need you to bring it to me. If anybody stops you, just tell them the Lord has need of it. What Jesus is counting on is that the people that they ask already know who he is. Because ain't nobody going to let go of nothing unless they already know who Jesus is. Y'all keep going to the wrong people asking for stuff that don't belong to you because they don't belong to him. If they belong to him, it's not going to be anything that stops them. That's called favor. I need somebody in here who's ever had to take a risk. You didn't have no down payment. You didn't have no money. You didn't know how it was going to happen. But you went because the Lord says, I got need of it. And because of the favor on your life and because the person you asked knew him, they said, oh, that's all you had to say. That's how you get your baby in a HBCU when 10,000 spots have already been picked and the president says, I got one more spot. That's not because she was lucky. That's because she's got favor. Y'all funny. Y'all acting funny. Listen, it's not a risk if Jesus told you to do it. Lord have mercy. Did y'all hear what I just said? I said it's not a risk if Jesus sent you. He will never send you where his grace will not provide for you. Look at your neighbor and say, go take a risk for Jesus. Oh, y'all, y'all be seated. Y'all act like I'm trying to preach or something. Watch out. Oh. Number two, y'all ready for number two? Are you tied up in the streets? I said, I said, is the reason Jesus can't use you is because you're still tied up in the streets. I, am I in the text? Uh, Elgin, when he goes to find the donkey, where's the donkey? Tied up. My Bible says it was in the, in the streets in front of a closed door. Some of y'all can't get through any doors because you're still tied up in the streets. I, I, I was listening to some young men talk the other day, John Burris, uh, about one of them had a girlfriend who was just kind of out there doing her thing. She's on Instagram showing everything. Uh, and the young men I was talking to, they say, no, nah, she's she not girlfriend material. She's for the streets. And I'm like, what that is? What does that mean? I'm, I'm getting a little old. I'm losing touch with the slang and the vernacular. What does it mean when somebody is for the streets? What it means is, is that this young lady is promiscuous. That she has, she's allergic to commitment. She's not ready to settle down with one man. She's promiscuous. And, it, and this, this term for the streets is, is, according to Urban Dictionary, is for somebody who is somewhat promiscuous. But, but a lot of women find this offensive because it's, it's slut-shaming for women, watch this, who are probably nine times out of ten doing what men been doing. So the problem is not just with women. 
is for people in period who are still for the streets. How you going to find a wife when you're still hoeing in the streets? How you going to provide for your family when you can't let go of ill-gotten gain? If you're still finding, if you're still hustling without any legitimate way or legal way to provide for your family, you're still tied up in the streets. If you're trying to be in a committed relationship and you got a chick on the side, you're still tied up in the streets. If you are always trying to scheme and plot and get something uh, that, that is not sanctioned by God, it could be that you're tied up in the streets. And as long as you're for the streets, you can never get through open doors. Y'all not mad at me, are you? Oh, she's for the street. It's important to note that this phrase is derogatory, and it, but I think it applies to all people who lack the ability to commit to something. Because the truth of the matter is that women are not the only ones that are entangled because of their fear of commitment. If you're more consistent in going to the club than you are to the church, you're still tied in the streets. Jesus is looking for men and women who need to be untied so that he can use them for higher purposes. I just need some people who are tired of the streets and you're ready for God to use you to look at somebody and say, untie me, Lord, I'm ready to ride. <sighs> Number three, I got to ask y'all another question. Y'all ready? What is your response to nosy people? Get out my business. When the disciples start untying the coat, there were some nosy people who wanted to know what you're doing. Now, I appreciate these folk in this text. I appreciate the folks in this text because I, I want somebody to look out for me. If somebody come in my driveway and they're they trying to get in my car, I'm going to want my neighbor to say, what you doing? So I'm not bashing these people. They, they were very inquisitive for a good reason because that was not their coat. And so they're asking, what are y'all doing untying that coat? And they responded back to what Jesus told them to say, and, Jesus, and they said, the Lord has need of it. Now, the word Lord is not, it's in the Greek word K-Y-R-I-O-S, which means Lord or Master. What Jesus was doing is what most kings do, and that is to commandeer a vehicle. It was under his kingly authority to request somebody else's property. But the difference between Jesus and an earthly king is that when an earthly king commandeers your donkey, you ain't getting it back. Jesus says, tell them the Lord has need of it, and I'm going to give it back when I'm done. Somebody needs to catch that in the spirit because every time God asks you for something, you act like he ain't going to give it back. Jesus says, give, and I'll give it back to you, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. Can I talk to a hundred of y'all real quick that the next time God puts it in your spirit to let God use something, know that it's coming back to you. Is there anybody that can testify that when I release it to Jesus, it came back double fold, it came back a hundred fold, I didn't even miss it while it was gone, and when I got it back, it was better than when I received it in the first place? Is there anybody in here who's ever given God your life? and what you gave God is better than what you could have imagined? Is there anybody that can stand up and say, give, and he'll give it back to you? <laughs> Woo, y'all a hard crowd today. <laughs> he, said, he, says, he says, I'm going to give it back. Watch this. There are going to be some people in this next season who ain't going to understand the shift that God's going to make in you. They're going to look at you as a person that used to be tied up and preoccupied, and now you're liberated and set free. They're not going to understand how come you don't come to the places you used to come to. They're not going to understand why you're not tied up at the bar trying to get somebody to go home with you. They're not going to understand why you're not coming to the club like you used to. They're not going to understand how come you're not getting high with them anymore. They're not going to understand how come you're not answering their booty calls at 3 o'clock in the morning anymore. But what you can tell them is, says, I'm sorry, but the 
the Lord had need of me. Is there anybody in here that knows that I can't stay in the same place and move forward at the same time? I've got to allow the Lord to untangle me in this season. I feel the Holy Ghost coming in here. Is there anybody right now that wants to give God permission to untie you so that the Lord can use you? Look at your neighbor and say, this is my season to get untied. I'm ready to get untied. I'm wrapped up, tied up in stuff that's been holding me back too long. I'm ready for God to unloose me. I'm ready for God to loose me and let me go. Somebody shake your feet. Stand up and shake your feet and say, I can't be tied down any longer. I can't be bound any longer. I've got to go and do what the Lord has set me free to do. God is getting ready to send some disciples to untie you. Stop, Mr. Piano Man. I appreciate you, but let me play. Let me say something to you. I prophesied to a hundred of y'all right now that this week, God sent some people to untie you from all the hell you've been going through. Get ready for somebody, a recruiter, to call you and say, I got another job for you. I'm getting ready to untie you. Somebody, the head of debt, a creditor is going to call you and say, we just forgiven you of all of your debt. Is there anybody in here that believes that God has the ability to send somebody to untie you from everything that's been holding you back? I need you to high five three people and say, this is my season to be unloosed, to be untied, to be unfettered. As a matter of fact, I'm off the chain. Is there anybody in here that can stand up and decree and declare that I'm off the chain? There's more in 2024. I'm off the chain. I'm untied. I'm loose. Can't nothing hold me back. Oh, y'all, y'all say they're on the tied up people can't see. Stand up. Listen, listen. listen. I, I, I feel like God is doing something new. The Lord has needed me. Is there anybody in here that realizes that you were born for more than just being a beast of burden? In this season, can't just anybody ride me. I'm going to say that slow so the people in the back can catch it. In this season, I can't just let anybody ride me. And the only reason, only way they can ride you is if you bend over. I need some help in here. This is, I'm not bending over for anybody who's not anointed to ride with me. I'm not bending over for anybody and abandoning who I am. I'm not laying down my dignity just so you can feel good about yourself, about riding me, when you have not been anointed to ride me. Can't just let nobody ride with me or on me. Was that too rough? Don't, 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 don't untie me unless the Lord sent you. I said, I said what I said. I said, don't let nobody untie you if the Lord has not sent them. Quit saying yes to every invitation. Every invite does not be, need to be responded to. If it does not fit God's purpose for your life, you need to say, no, I ain't coming. I'm tied up. The only people that can untie me is those that God sent. That's apostolic. The word apostle means sent. Don't entertain people who are not flowing in the apostolic. Don't entertain people who are stuck in tradition and try to tie you up with them. Be careful of people who want to untie you and take you away from your destiny and then lock you in to a place that's not your purpose. <laughs> I'm, I'm almost done, y'all. One more. Watch this. Look at your neighbor and say, have you been broken in yet? I, I said, y'all, that this donkey had never been ready. Help me real quick. People watch Discovery Channel stuff. Uh, how do you break in a horse? You got to ride it? How can you ride it if it ain't never been ridden? Huh? You got to jump on it? 
Mama Mims, how do you ride a horse that ain't never been ridden? You, oh, my God. I want her to say this on the mic. You what? You got to start a relationship with God. You got to start a relationship. Don't you beat it? You don't beat the horse? There's two different ways you can break a horse. You can break it until it has more, no more will left, which is beating it and whipping it. But the horse, chances are, would never be the horse it could have been because the will has been broken. But the, the more effective way is when they use what's called a horse whisperer. The horse whisperer comes along and just pets the horse and wins his trust. One day it might just touch him and then walk away. The next day he just sits down and just sits with the horse so the horse is comfortable with his presence. Then he's going to feed the horse and sit back and talk to the horse. Y'all not going to help me. That's what Jesus had to do with you. He eased up on you. God whispers in our pleasure, but he shouts in our pain. What he had to do was to show you he, you could trust him because he fed you. He watered you. He clothed you. He loved you. And then when you hit rock bottom, you remembered who clothed you, who watered you, who stroked. Y'all ain't going to help me. It wasn't that God came to you and beat you and broke you in order to ride you. He came alongside. That's why Jesus says, watch this. He says, if you want to be my disciple, take my yoke upon you. For my yoke is easy and my what? My burdens are light. Do y'all know what a yoke is? Help me teach real quick. A yoke is a wooden instrument with a hole on this side and a hole on this side. Are y'all listening to me? A yoke is for a donkey. That donkey Jesus called for uh, when he was to be matured would have a yoke on his neck. But he's a young donkey who's never been ridden. And Jesus tells us as disciples to take what? My yoke. That yoke has two sides. So who's going to be on the other side of the donkey? Who's going to be on the other side of the yoke that Jesus is talking about? Jesus is on the other side. And we are on the other side. He says, take my yoke. I don't want you to carry my weight. I want you to help me pull the weight of God's glory. Is there anybody that knows that the only reason you haven't gone crazy... The only reason you haven't committed suicide is because when you look over at the yoke, you see Jesus walking with you. I need somebody to help me preach today. Would you high five your neighbor and say, I got somebody helping me pull. I got somebody helping me with my weight. I got somebody that's helping me, and his name is Jesus. All right, I'm getting ready to go. I got I got 10 minutes. I'm going to go. Watch this. Uh, the Bible says that, that when they untied him, untied the coat, and they brought him to Jesus, the disciples, watch this, threw their cloak over the donkey. Jesus sits on the donkey, and the donkey don't buck. He sits on the donkey, and the donkey don't, Yeah, the donkey just allows, I need some help in here. I say he's never been ridden before, but when Jesus gets on him, he goes from wild to tame. Y'all ain't going to help me. When you allow Jesus to get on you, the stuff you used to do, you ain't going to want to do no more. When Jesus gets on you, you used to cuss, and now you're saying praise the Lord. When Jesus gets on you, you used to get drunk, now you get high off the Holy Ghost. Is there anybody in here who knows that Jesus changed your nature? I should have cussed them out, but for some reason I bit my tongue. I should to shot somebody, but instead I fell on my knees. You want to know why? Because Jesus is on you. And when Jesus gets on you, that wildness has to leave. They are laying down, they are laying down their cloaks and palm branches on the ground. Give me that palm branch. I, I, I had to do some research. And I said, what's the significance? Everybody hold your palm up. What's the significance of a palm branch? Some of y'all didn't get an outfit. Sorry, please. Oh. 
Break off a piece of branch for somebody that ain't got no branch and hand it to them. Y'all break off a piece of branch. I need everybody to hold a branch up. <clears throat> the branch is symbolic of the fact it ain't going to break. It's plastic. Okay, all right. Uh, that's on me. That's on me. I'll get you some real ones next year. Uh. Rodney, that was embarrassing. <laughs> here, here, I got two. Take, that, take one right there. All right. So I looked it up, and what I discovered was is that it takes 30 years for a palm branch to mature. Watch this. The only way you could be a high priest is that you had to be 30. Jesus was 30 when he started his ministry. He was 33 when he was crucified. So when they see Jesus, also the palm branch, symbolic of victory. The Egyptians and the Israelites and the Greco-Romans, whenever there was a victory, they would throw down palm branches when the, when the Victorian was coming in. When the king returned from battle and was victorious, they threw down their palm branches. Y'all not going to help me. They threw down the palm branches in, in symbolic of the victory. Jesus comes into Jerusalem, and they call it the triumphant entry. But that's not how the story ends. Because when he gets to Jerusalem, they're going to kill him. Y'all not going to help me. When he gets to Jerusalem, they're going to crucify him. So why do they call it triumphant victory? Because watch this. They don't know it yet, but the cross is not the last stopping place. What they're doing is symbolically prophesying that though he's coming, in to die, he's not going to ride out the same way he rode in. I need somebody right now who believes that God has victory in your near future to stand up and wave your palm branch as a sign that God is about ready to give you the victory. I want you to slap palms with somebody and tell them you're right, you're just right for a miracle. This is your season. It's your 30th year. This is your season. God says, I'm getting ready to allow you to roll in and ride in with Jesus. How y'all going to handle it in this next season that God has given to you? They threw off their cloaks. Watch this. The cloaks, it was the only thing that they had of value. Their cloaks had in the inseam of the collar, Lord of lords and King of kings. And so when they saw Jesus, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, they took off their garments, their Versace, their Gucci, and their Louis, and they said these are just rags compared to who's riding in right now. And they threw it on the floor. I wish I had somebody who could throw it on the floor this morning and say, for you, Jesus, I'm laying it all down. I'm laying down my addiction to marijuana. I'm laying down my lustful tendencies. I'm laying down my material mindset. I'm laying down my bad habits. I'm laying down my choices. I'm laying down my preferences. I'm laying down my fear. I'm laying down depression. Somebody throw it on the ground and let Jesus come on in. And when he came in, they kept saying, Hosanna, which means Lord save. They kept saying, Hosanna, God be praised for he who comes in the name of the Lord. Can I hear y'all holler out, Hosanna? Can I hear somebody say, Hosanna? Can I hear somebody say, come on in, Jesus. Come on into my family. Come on into my business. Come on into my church. Come on into my life. Hosanna, Hosanna, save my marriage. Hosanna, save my children. Hosanna, save my finances. Hosanna, save my life. Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna. Watch this. Watch this. I, I'm just about done. When they, when y'all keep standing, when they, when they come in Jerusalem and everybody's hollering Hosanna and they're praising Jesus and they're throwing palm branches and they're throwing down their cloaks. It says that Jesus rode into Jerusalem and went into the temple and he looked around the temple and wasn't nobody in there because it was late in the evening and Jesus turned around and went outside of Jerusalem. Isn't that anticlimactic? But really it ain't. 
because what the text shows me is that enthusiasm doesn't equal commitment. Because the same people, are y'all there? The same people, Pat, that yelled Hosanna a week later were the same people that said crucify him. Because crowds are not ride or die. Just because you're in a crowd today don't mean you're going to be a disciple tomorrow. On one occasion, I close with this story. Just play me something soft. I close with this story. Philip, Down Thomas, on one occasion when Jesus was going to heal or raise Lazarus from the dead, he heard that Lazarus was sick. And the Bible says that Jesus, when he heard that his friend Lazarus was sick, he stayed where he was two more days. And he told the disciples, we need to go see Lazarus because he's, he's dead. He's, t- he's dead and, and, and he's asleep. And they said, well, if he's asleep, he's going to wake up and get better. He, and so he said plainly, Lazarus is dead. And he says, we need to go to Judea. He says, and, and Thomas says, did not those people say that they were going to stone you and us if you came back? And Jesus says, we must work while it's day. For when night comes, no man will be able to work. And Thomas looks at the other disciples, and it sounds like he's being sarcastic, but he says to the other disciples, let's go with them to die then. But when I read that, I've always read it as sarcasm. But when I read it again, because what we call Thomas doubting Thomas, but when I read it again through the eyes of a commentator, one commentator says, that Thomas wasn't being sarcastic, he was showing his faith. He did not know what would happen when they got to Judea. He did not know what was going to happen with Lazarus, who was already dead. He didn't know that when they, if they saw Jesus and on sight, they pick up rocks and start throwing it at Jesus. And this, He didn't know, but one thing he did know is that I'm riding and dying with this man. I'm locked in. They can't punk me out on the internet. They're not going to troll me. They, I know too much about them for them to make me doubt them. And if I, if I get dealt with, I just get dealt with. Is there anybody that's made up your mind that I'm not turning back from Jesus? I'm not turning back. Though none go with me, still I will follow. Have you made up your mind that you're going to be a ride or die disciple? Listen, I want to give an invitation real quick, and we're leaving up out of here. As you stand on your feet, everybody, I want you to listen to three questions. Are you still tied up in the streets? If so, you can say no to the streets and yes to God today. Have you really been broken? Holiness is what you long for, but brokenness is what you need. Have you allowed the Lord to break you in by walking with him? He doesn't want to hurt you. He's not trying to, he's not trying to break you. He's trying to bless you. But you got to be broken in the sense that you got a contrite heart to say, God, I tried it my way and my way didn't work. I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired. I want to try it God's way. Can you break yourself today and say, God, I surrender? And then you got to ask yourself this question. Can I untie myself? Will I allow the Holy Spirit to untie me so I can get to this altar this morning?